Herzlich willkommen zurück beim Gespräch mit Zoe Chance. Heute sprechen wir über Einfluss, den Einfluss, den wir gerne ausüben wollen. Zoe Chance, it's a great honor to have you back and uh, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with you to chat about influence. In the first part, we were talking about uh, how to be charismatic and how to be um, to become a person that people want to um, follow and want to um, be influenced by. And I was uh, thinking about uh, something else that, uh, that that is connected to this. Adam Grant, who is also an awesome uh, an awesome scientist, um, he he did um, a book about givers and takers and those in between. So. Um, People, I love that book. It's one of my favorite books. Yes. Uh, 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 could you summarize uh, uh, the, the the idea behind that? It's it's because you want don't want to be perceived as a taker. So yes, um, the idea when, when when you want the, the people to follow you, yeah? that is in a, in a relationship in general, but especially in a in a relationship when it comes to uh, convincing other people. Um. Yeah, I guess I'll share the main thing that I took away from this book yes. is there are three types of people. He calls it reciprocity styles, and everyone falls into primarily one of these styles, although we're in different modes and different situations. And like you said, there's givers and takers. And the third part that you describe as being in the middle are matchers. And it's it depends what your goal is, which of these you fall into. It's not actually what behavior you do, but givers are focused on the good that they can do for other people. Like Andreas, it's so clear from everything that you do that that's your motivation. You're trying to do what you can to help other people to lead a good life, right? If that weren't your motivation, you'd you'd be on a completely different path than yeah. what you're carving. Absolutely. Takers. Yeah. yeah. And me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. um, and And I will also say though, A lot of us think that we're givers, but in Adam Grant's research, he finds that the majority of us are matchers. I'll talk about it in a second. So, um, so we might be wrong. I might be wrong about myself, but I'm definitely right about you. The the second group are the takers, and these are people who are motivated by what they can get for themselves. And if you talk to economists, they believe everyone is ultimately a taker, and they'll say, you know, oh well, even if you're doing good for other people you're just doing it because of because that makes you feel good and so you're still selfish and you're still in taker mode so we could argue about it i would still call call you a giver then the third motivation for the matchers is they're motivated by fairness and justice so it's not just you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But we need to, if I do a favor for you, you definitely need to pay me back. If you do a favor for me, I definitely need to pay you back. And it's Usually not just we want between, to. Usually we want to. Yeah, there's, there's a universal norm of reciprocity across every single culture that, that every culture has reciprocity. And there's this universal obligation to give, to receive, and to repay. But matchers have that repayment as a dominant motive in their life. And you know if you're a matcher or that you might be, if it makes you really upset when uh, somebody does something that's unfair to you or to another person. And there are some incredible matchers who are like, they're the superhero police force of our entire world and our society where they're going to try and punishing the takers. So Adam Grant interestingly finds that there are, although at every level of success, there's a melange of givers, takers, and matchers, at the top and at the bottom, there people are more likely to be givers. And that was the, the big idea of his book is, wow, giving can get you ahead. The givers at the top are people who have learned to draw boundaries and they've learned to ask and they've learned to advocate for themselves. The givers at the top can be visionary leaders and a visionary leader is always going to need to ask for more than they can repay. So the givers at the top are not people who are never receiving. 
It's that their motivation is do the most good that they can. Typically, that's do the most good they can for the most people. And so what that means is they also end up becoming this, like a society of superheroes or do-gooders. It's like this secret cabal where we're helping each other because that's how we can do the most good for the most people, right? But then at the bottom, people are also more likely to be givers. And that's because givers who are passive givers, passively generous, incredibly kind, become martyrs who just get taken advantage of. And the difference between the givers at the bottom and at the top is also a matter of time, where over time you figure out who are the takers. So maybe you got taken advantage of when you first met them and now not so much. And then also over time, you have more ability to give. And it's not just um, you know things like having more money as you advance in your career, but you have more connections and more social capital. And it's easier for you to do more favors for people. And those givers at the top have the biggest social networks out of anybody. I find it also really interesting that the reason the takers aren't rising to the top as much, even though they're the ones trying hardest to get to the top, is because of the matchers who are that force of trying to keep the takers down. And that's a big reason that the matchers don't get to the top as well, because they're wasting their energy. And I, I, it's a prejudice for me to even say wasting, because if you're fighting for fairness and justice, <laughs> I apologize to all of you who are doing that. I really appreciate it. It's just that you're making a personal sacrifice that um, is spending your energy on the takers rather than the other kinds of doing good and being successful that you might be able to enjoy. Second thing about matchers that's really important is that if you are somebody who can't ask a favor that you can't repay then you're definitely holding yourself back from doing as much good as you could and becoming as influential as you could. So that was a long description of <laughs> this research and this book that I love, but it's so important and relevant for all of us who want to be more influential than we already are. And yeah, I just find it fascinating. And, and we so, could end. But end I guess the, Andreas, we could end the I just have to right dare you. It would be all all fitting in, yeah. But, <laughs> I but just I, have to to dare you to be reaching out to these people. Yes, yes, and and still and still, if uh, I want at least one technique that we might be able to use, but it's not it's not really a technique. You try to refocus people thinking about a certain topic by giving them another perspective, uh, by giving them a new um vocabulary uh, and, and this is called framing it's, it's it's a word that's even got into german it's called frames and framing in journalism and uh, since uh, uh, especially since uh mr trump uh, got into office uh, he was a he was very proficient in this how can we use framing for good there are politicians out there that use, use uh, try to manipulate us with framing into the negative. But uh, if we are in, in our everyday lives or in our business conversations, in ne negotiations maybe, how can we use framings in a positive way? And you, you, have, you have three, uh, three different uh, frames that we might or shall use. Right. And to start thinking about framing, I think it's helpful to... Um, acknowledge that there are two pieces of framing and they kind of get overlapped and mushed together when a lot of people are talking about framing and that framing is talking about a perspective that someone has like if you imagine That's persuasion as 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 Cialdini called it yeah um that you, that it, you do a preframe it so before even doing a preframe yeah. somebody has a perspective mm -hmm. what like politics is a easy domain, you have a preference one way or another, or a particular way that you're conceiving of a problem. That, let's like, go to, to the personal development field or to, to health. Okay. We say, uh, losing weight is a heart, is a heart, it's heart. Yeah. So that's For a example. perspective. Yeah. That's a perspective. Happens to be true, but it's also a perspective. Yeah. And, and so it's this assumption that you have coming well, in. If you want to be successful, you have to work hard. Let's say that is. Yeah. 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 Um, at literally every topic, 
in life, you already have some kind of perspective, some kind of frame. But a frame, when we talk about framing, it also means the label or the name that you give something. And names, labels, the words that we use can influence the perspective. So a frame is both. It, it's either, it's both the perspective and also the label. And what a frame does is it influences somebody's expectations. And that's the pre-framing or persuasion that you're talking about. It can influence somebody's through influencing their expectations, it can influence their experience. And then by influencing their experience, it can also influence their perceptions and their evaluations. And to make this more concrete. Yes, please. An example. This, yeah. yeah that there's this study that I love and that I find hilarious by a neuroscientist. Her name is Hilke Plasman. Um, and she was doing this research, uh, I think when she was at INSEAD. And She's studying the framing effects of price and experimenting with wine drinkers. So I know you don't do drugs. I don't know if you drink wine at all. I'm a wine drinker. So I would have volunteered for the study and then tremendously regretted it because she's a neuroscientist. And so and if you're drinking wine in her study, you're in an fMRI machine and you have this little tiny tube going into your mouth and it's feeding you sips of wine and then scanning your brain. And it's calculating the activation in the gustatory pleasure centers, the medial orbital frontal cortex of your mind. And before each sip of wine she gives you, she tells you how much this bottle of wine costs. And she's giving you expensive wines and she's giving you cheap wines. And she's not saying how much did you like it. She is scanning your mind, scanning your brain to see how much you liked it, the physiological reaction. So if you're a wine drinker, or anyone actually shouldn't be surprised that more expensive wines created greater activation in these pleasure centers. However, it was a study on framing. So the prices are randomized. It's the same wine that she's giving you saying that it's expensive or saying that it's cheap, but it's your body that's interpreting from this frame. This is the expectation effect. It creates the experience of that wine was really delicious. So that's the subconscious level at which we are processing frames and how they influence us. It, it can't be overestimated how important frames are. And especially um, for, I, I'm, I was going to say for business leaders, cause I talked to a lot of business leaders, but it's in all of our communication. If there's something that we really, really care about, we can pay more and better attention to the words that we use to describe it. That has somebody deciding, is this some, something that they're interested in, not interested in? Is it a big deal? Is it not a big deal? And the three frames you were asking me about, okay, what are the three frames that that I see as most important. And um, it's not that these frames are more important than other frames in a particular context. Frames no, are it's, infinite. It's just, let, let's, let's take a situation that we really have um, some kind of toolbox for ourselves that we, when, when we go out and we, we uh, get into a situation where the, we don't know how to handle it. Uh, how could we uh, use the, the 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 toolbox for us, the framing toolbox? So, I would suggest don't even bother to think about this too much, unless there's something that you care about and you anticipate some potential resistance to it, or you just want to practice, right? But let's say um, that you would. Uh, like to per like I don't know. Do you have anything in your life that you'd like to persuade someone of right now? Maybe our our, our, that, our uh, uh, listeners or uh, viewers at home that they shall uh, um, recommend my videos to others, and so yeah, that, that might might be something. I think yeah. that uh, that to me. I think my my uh, some of my or most of the work I do is uh, such uh, valuable stuff that I'm really um, kind of disappointed that only a few thousand people watch it. Okay, so when 
and like and if then we I don't see end people doing... who do really bad stuff and hundreds of thousands of people watch it. I'm really so disappointed annoying, by the right? people. So, so I'm annoying. asking myself, what can I do? Okay, so and it might have to do with frames, or it might have to do with other things. And those yeah. three, the toolbox of three frames, we'll make sure we cover it before we're done. Um, but but we'll just have this conversation, and I'll try to be as helpful as possible. How do you currently ask people to recommend your videos? Not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Only this only in the commentary section, maybe. Yeah. If they say, "Wow, such a great, such a, gr a great uh, conversation," I learned so much, and I say, "Okay, then please uh, share it with your friends so that we can reach more people." Yeah. So, it's really kind of embarrassing. I teach this class at Yale. The class I teach is the most popular course at the business school at Yale School of Management. And at the end of this intense seven-week boot camp thing that we do, science and strategies and real-world challenges, I invite students to come up to the front of the room and each person shares the biggest thing that they learned and are taking away. The number one thing most common every year of the decade that I've been doing it is just ask. And we just can't, we can't really understand how important the asking part is until we start to practice it. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that research has found, and this is Vanessa Bonds and some of her colleagues, in a series of experiments, people are two or three times more likely to say yes to an in-person request than we expect. And it's a little bit less as, it, as the contact, contact gets less direct, a lot less as it's a one-to-many request instead of a one-to-one So it's one telephone, then, then it's email. How, 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 do, how would you uh, rank it? Uh, like Zoom would be a little bit less than in person, right? And then we have telephone, email, and then social media, like a post on social media just to everybody. It has much less engagement than people imagine that it will be. Listening to the secret followers, you could say you have to only have to think about it and connect in a deep level. And they will they will really, I'm thinking about, connect, call me, call me, most beautiful girl in the world. Call me, call me. I don't know. My oh my God, I, was, I my hate telephone that stuff was so still, much. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you so know this law of attraction thing, yeah, yeah. Yes, I hate the yeah. law of attraction. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's fascinating just sitting there and thinking about your dream girl or dream boy and it will maybe... Yeah. The, the reason why people love the law of attraction is that it seems so easy and people are so lazy. We talked about that in our first session, how laziness is the dominant process that determines what we're going to do yeah, or in, not in, in, do. Yeah, in business, right? you 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 mentioned this this uh, this uh, the the easy ideas the 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 better for the company. There is an index even for that. Right. Yeah. It's yes. It's called the, the customer the effort ease, score. The ease, uh, ease con e How is it called? The ease. The metric in English is called the customer effort score. Customer effort score. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I I only learned in my studies about uh, how uh, how many people recommend your stuff is is important. The opinion. Uh, word of mouth. Word right. Of mouth marketing. And, yeah. And customer effort score is actually more predictive of things like increased spending and loyalty than word of mouth, which typically gets measured as net promoter score. Yeah. But and customer effort score or ease is also the biggest predictor of, I think it's word of mouth altogether, but definitely negative word of mouth. And negative word of mouth is more impactful than positive word of mouth. So the number one thing determining do people complain about whatever it is that you do is how easy or difficult was it? Mm. When you're, so when you are asking people, so is it leaving a, re, leaving a review that you want to ask people to do? Or that you want people to just, do? Just sharing, sharing the videos. Subscribing, to, sharing the videos. So They can donate as well, of, so I'm happy about that, but nobody donates. So, yeah. When you're asking people to share the video, the, you want the video to go to people who might share it widely. And when you're asking, you want to be asking individual people because these general broad asks that we make posting on social media hey would you do this thing those are less successful than we expect in person direct ask to one human being more successful than we expect 
one-to-many, distant social media, much less. So when you're asking people to share, do that individually and not just to people who are making comments. So what you're doing already with that is great. But when you have a new video, have specific people that you reach out to, and those are your fans, right? Your specific fans who've said, we love you. We love your work. You're reaching out. I don't know if you have a newsletter or something like this. Do you do that already? Not yet. Okay. I do have a newsletter list, but I don't write them. So this <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that's the next step. And the people who will be sharing are the people who love you. The big fans love your work. They want to share it. And then you're reaching out to them each time you have a new one. Here's this thing that's great. Here's why. Would you please share it? And then you make it as easy as possible for, you know, so you have the links that make it easy for them to share. And then you're also asking, though, I encourage you to ask and I know this is hard because you haven't asked me and we can talk offline, but um, you haven't been, I think, asking people to make connections for you to other people that they know as much as you could. And that might be the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah. So, so this is what all of us need to do more and we need to do better and it's awkward. And so let's talk right now about a way how you might do that. And this is getting back to the framing in a way that doesn't put too much pressure and has the other person that you're making a direct ask. So, so offline, <laughs> after this conversation, you'll ask me directly for a connection to someone that I know who you would like to know. Okay. Okay. I will. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and what I want to help you do is make it as comfortable as possible for me if I'm not ready to say yes, so that I can say no, but feel like I'm not hurting your feelings or like you and I can still be friends, even if I'm not willing to do what you're asking, which is, hey, Zoe, will you give me social capital and connect me with this person, right? So do you want to, do you want to just, um, just, well, I'll just give you give you some advice instead of putting you on the spot to come up with something. Or do you want to tell me how you would do it? No, no, no. I just I just think that uh, we're we're too di digging too deep in this too very deep? topic as, okay. as as this won't concern too many of my viewers. All right. Well, I actually the reason I was starting to go deep in this is that I think it concerns everyone. In a way, it does. But, yes. But. Yes. We can finish it offline. So, so let me just wrap up this part by saying that the idea of asking people for connections and for referrals is a major skill that people need to build when they're working in sales. And it's a skill that almost none of the rest of us ever do build. And what we want to do in this kind of request like in all requests, is ask in a way that acknowledges you might not, like this might not be comfortable for you, no pressure, please don't do this unless you feel like it, but if it might be possible and just ask for a specific thing. So asking for a specific connection, asking for, this also applies to reaching out to ask somebody for advice, right? Like even strangers, when we reach out, and ask for 15 minutes of advice, shockingly, even so many very successful people will say yes to Dear 15 Mr. minutes Obama, of advice. Just 15 minutes of your time, Mr. Obama <laughs> or Mrs. Obama would also be interesting. It, it, yeah. it just depends how many other people are asking them. Mm -hmm. Right. So like Hi, Obama, Mrs. Oprah. <laughs> yeah. Obama, yeah. Oprah, yeah. probably not. But I've oh, had yeah. students reach out and actually two different cabinet level ministers one was in brazil and one was in i think it was ghana uh, had conversations with my students now i'm acknowledging they go to yale and they get to say i'm a yale student and so that just I know gives a them yale a little bit of now extra <laughs> it gives them a little bit of extra attention that somebody pays but a cabinet minister is not someone who's likely to be giving 30 minutes of job coaching, career coaching advice to 
anyone, regardless of who they are or what school they go to. But those are not people that everyone is reaching out to and asking for advice. Um, so definitely, like whoever you are, whatever it is that you're working on, if you just started practicing asking, asking more, more often in a warm way, make it easy for the other person to say no, it's going to be revolutionizing your whole entire life. And the last thing here, if you feel like um, doing a ninja move on your own personal development is I challenge you to practice getting rejected. When you have that frame of I'm trying to get rejected, doing something that I care about and will be really happy if it works, then you can't possibly lose. Mm -hmm. The last thing uh, in, in concerning your topic before I ask my very last question, um, deep connections. Um, uh, and and uh, building trust. I think building trust is uh, maybe they call it capital, as in as we are in a in a capitalistic world. It's the social capital. Yeah, I should capital, shift that frame, but, shouldn't I? Yeah, but yeah, but, uh, it. I don't think it's a social capital. It's it's trust is just the biggest gift I could give to you. It's it's the deepest connection. You 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 mentioned the frame love already and i guess uh, i guess that uh, trust is really this um upfront love kind of I, i i trust you so much that you won't harm me and and you've got also my interested in my interest in in the back of your mind i like that frame. how, ca It's how nice. can we we or is what ways are there to really And this is once again this this male approach of how to engineer a, <laughs> how to engineer a trustworthy uh, relationship. Um, I, is that and, even possible, or is it just something that develops over time? But but I know people that you meet them, and within 10 minutes, you know, here's my child. So kind of like that. Yeah, it's it's like, what is it that they do differently? So. Just briefly, a couple of quick things. First of all, real trust is built over a long time. However, it's not that you have to necessarily be investing for a long time in each of these relationships, but by building a reputation of someone who is generous and kind and trustworthy, then somebody meeting you who knows a little bit about you easily trusts you. That's the best thing that you can be doing. Um, a tactical kind of thing that uh, is, it's not building deep I'm even trust, thinking about people like you, you are, you're a fan of, of the mentalist Darren Brown. And I'm thinking about, about uh, similar people over here then. And, and they are just, you, you meet them and they have such a, a, a charisma and, 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 and I don't know, an, an aura That, that take you in. You just, they, they, as, as if they were your friends for, for the last 20 years when you're with them just a few minutes. Yeah. So, so a lot of that is just charisma, like we've been talking yeah. about. Um, just that feeling of connection. And especially they, though, they, what with, they're with doing with their eyes, they're just in, what, in your, they, they're connecting kind of with their eyes to you. Yeah. What they're doing that's so hard to resist is they're liking you. And it's incredibly hard to not like somebody who likes you. And for those of us who aren't used to being very physically demonstrative with our nonverbals, it's it really helps to practice eye contact and smiling. And the asking questions again has people feel that you like them. But but what I want to say is like actually like them. When I was growing up, one of the grown-ups I admired a great deal was married to an ambassador. And she had the perspective that you meet all kinds of people and some of them are easier to like, some of them are harder to like, but every single person that you meet, have it be your goal to find one person to like about them. And she said, Zoe, even if it's just her earrings, <laughs> like their earrings. And interestingly, you don't have to talk about it You can if you want, and you can compliment them, only do it sincerely, right? Something that you appreciate. But when you find something that you like about that person and you focus on that thing about that person, they will feel it 
and they will find you much harder to resist. Mm -hmm. The final question that I ask each and every one of my guests is, um, I origi originally started this, this, this whole um, concept here, this done in the Zukunft, because I wanted to find, after uh, the loss of my whole family, I wanted to find out how a, a, a good life, would, a happy life would still be possible. I've learned so much in school. I, I had several degrees, university degrees. I was really... Um, I had it on paper that I'm a smart person, yeah, but I just felt I have no idea. I have no idea what 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 can what shall I learn? What what do I need to know for now finding what a good life, uh, uh, um, a positive life would still be? And and then I I started this that, that I would have wanted some kind of school, some kind of university I could go to and learn this, and. Now let's say Lernen der Zukunft is this school. What kind of of um, ideas would you transfer there? What kind of subject would you like to teach there? Is it okay if I answer the question as what subject I would like to learn there? It's also possible. Because I don't know. Or if you want to, to send your daughter there, I, what, what yeah. shall she learn there? Yeah. I, I don't know how to teach this. It is something that I've, gotten to experience and you too and a lot of us what i believe is the secret to happiness is vicarious enjoyment and pleasure and that we take joy in other people's success and in other people's happiness because then there's no limit to the amount of happiness that you can have and any day no matter what's happening in your life you can find things to be happy about a lot of us is it that, that, feel isn't jealous. It that americans always say i always say good for you good for you if you mean it Is that an American thing? I, I always hear that from, I, I don't know if you know him, in, in the Shark Tank show, there is this, this juror, uh, <laughs> he is Mark Cuban. And, and, and always when people talk about their successes, he always says, oh, good for you. Good for, and you really see in his face, you believe him. He's really happy for these people that they uh, have been able to, to achieve such, such stuff. And yeah. uh, that's, that's uh, because I never hear that over here in German. Uh, that, oh, that they really? say, ah, oh, good für dich, freut mich für dich. It's just, ah, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but he's all, yeah. But, and he's always this, ah, oh, good for you, wow. So, hmm? I'm not a big fan of the Shark Tank show, but I'm a big fan of Mark Cuban. And I yeah. told you about some of my students. They all do this reach out to a hero challenge. And I was saying, you'll be surprised to hear back from famous people. He's one. So they reached out to Mark okay. Cuban in the reach out to a hero challenge. They heard back from him, but then they reached out to him actually again in another challenge where it was an asking challenge. And they asked him if he would be willing to donate hockey tickets. He's the owner of the, I think it's hockey, but I'm embarrassed now if I have the He's wrong sport. He's at least basketball, he uh, owned, basketball. Oh, maybe it's basketball? Okay. Yeah. The Dallas Mavericks, I think. He, he's an owner, part the owner of it. Basketball uh, league. Yeah, okay. Right? <laughs> so hilarious NBA. that you're the one who knows, right? <laughs> um, kind and, of. <laughs> and, and what they asked was for him to donate tickets to the It's called the Boys and Girls Club, but in his local town, so that kids who don't have money to go to a professional sports thing would get to go. And he just instantly said yes, and he made this charitable donation for them. So I really got to see that he's excited for other people to feel good, have a good life, have kinds of experiences that, you know, when he had just these small opportunities to take a little bit of time and make a tiny investment to help that happen. He did. So I really believe it. So there are good people doing uh, good stuff uh, and, and billionaires. He's a billionaire uh, doing good stuff as well. So that's another topic about talking about money mindset as people think if you have money, you have to be a bad person. Um, this is just another yeah. frame that uh, we need to conquer, but not. And today. he's trying to lower drug prices in the U S which we need really badly also. Mm. Mm -hmm. that's that's i i guess if you ever saw sicko you know why it's necessary you know the michael moore documentary sicko yeah where, where he talks yeah. about the the the, the uh, health system of the united states i mean we have lots of problems over here in europe but i guess the us has other challenges as well yeah? <laughs> at least this is what we can manage over here um yeah. it feels to me like we have just started 
it's it's i would have uh, hours and hours talking to you uh, and, and questions in the back of my mind but uh, we need to stop right here all i can do is recommend highly recommend your book der gute einfluss uh, to all of you also an alle an euch zu hause unbedingt das buch kann ich sehr empfehlen it's a, a really a recommend the book with lots of stories lots of insight uh, and um, thank you so much andreas and i'll just mention to readers if you decide that you do want to get this book, I'm donating half of my profits to organizations fighting the climate crisis. So you're part of that if you play the game along with me, but it should also be available at your library. So you do not have to buy it to get to read it. Thank you. I hope so. And um, thank you first. Uh, at first, I'm happy to welcome you back. At, 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 uh, spätestens, wenn du dann Deutsch sprichst, when you speak German, you're back and then... <laughs> But I hope even before. So maybe I can. Good, thank you. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. And now the final last words. Uh, the stage is yours. And uh, you can uh, give feedback to me. You can uh, talk to the people and, and give them the last advice, whatever you want. The last minute is yours. All that I will leave you with is the idea that if you are not failing in your pursuit of whatever your goals and dreams are, that's a sign that you're playing small. Just let it, let it sink in and be there. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your attention. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>